a lot of your questions tonight seem to be on the topic of communication. So how I approach communication in relationships is um, with vulnerability because vulnerability tends to diffuse defensiveness. Um, vulnerability is a power source. Vulnerability um, lets you be seen and felt and known. And when people see and feel and know you, then you can, um, they can better respond to you and be in real authentic communication in real time. When we approach our relationships defensively um, or with a mask of politeness, for instance, or people pleasing, um, I've been guilty of this in the past. In a way, we're putting on a mask, putting on a mask of what we think we, the other person wants us to be. And that really blocks intimacy. That really blocks true intimacy. So vulnerability is key because it opens the pathway of communication in real time, heart to heart, spirit to spirit. You can feel each other. You can feel the transmission of what the other person's feeling, even if they're not speaking. Um, so if I was in a conversation with a partner and I wanted to help my partner be more proactive about solving a problem rather than getting defensive about it, I might approach it like this. I might say something like, I noticed we have a problem. <laughs> I noticed that, you know, I noticed that I'm feeling tight and defensive, but I want to soften and open so that we can really work through this. Um, I noticed that, you know, because this is challenging for you, you know, your body language is tight, or I noticed that you're holding your breath. So I was wondering if we could just take a pause before we dive into the problem to feel each other. And then I would invite us to breathe for a second. And then I would start with I statements um, and encourage my partner to start with I statements. Um, if it's a really knotted problem, you can put a time limit on a timer and each person gets to speak their truth with no filter and with no interruption. Um, I've had that work really well in challenging situations in relationships before, especially in giving me a moment to pause and breathe before launching in. Because defensiveness is usually like an instinctual, fiery uh, response. And when you have a moment to take a breath while the other person is speaking, it might help you shift your perspective and actually listen to where they're coming from instead of responding from, you know, defensiveness is usually, you know, our childhood wounding or our patterns or, you know, maybe the million fights we've already had with this particular partner where we felt unheard or they felt unheard. Um, so it, it, it tends to, defensiveness tends to escalate the argument rather than diffuse it, which when it's diffused, there's, um, you're better able to actually work the problem out or have a solution come from um, more of a neutrality, not necessarily neutral because obviously if it's an emotional conversation, hard to be neutral, but that more measured response, I tend to notice goes over better in challenging situations. So not only would I do that and use I statements, but I might um, give suggestions for how I think, you know, it could be solved. Or if I was wanting them to take more ownership, I might ask them questions, asking curious questions like, you know, how, how would you foresee solving this problem? Or from your past experiences in life, when presented with a problem like this, how would you handle it? Um, Questions can turn the conversation. Uh, it can be a way to shift things um, because it puts you both in a state of curiosity rather than the rather driving defensiveness that might be happening at the time. Aha, and uh, she clarified, it's a problem in the, within the relationship, not an outside source. Yeah, so if it was a problem in the relationship, I might say something like, you know, I noticed that we keep bumping up against this challenge. Um, 
and I'm frustrated and you're frustrated and I want us to work through this. So um, rather than reacting, which I feel like I want to do right now, I would like to ask you, um, you know, what are some possible solutions that you can see about this problem? And then while they spoke, I would wait and breathe. Breath is your friend <laughs> because it brings you into rest and digest from fight or flight where you might be in an argument. So I hope that helps. Do you have any? Yeah. Um, so, so basically it's like, I just wanted to follow up um, on something that I brought up um, I think a month ago um, about the, the anxiety that I have basically with just dealing with, you know, people in general, and most importantly, um, since I'm a, since I'm a performer, um, just trying to overcome, um, overcome my stage fright, which, you know, has been pretty much just the big, um, the big block in me really advancing to where I want to be, you know, in in my particular field. So that, so that, that was something that his, caused me to like um, reject gigs and just reject go uh, job offers just because of that incredible fear that I have just performing live. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you for your question and thank you for your vulnerability. Well, one, I really want to ask you, did it, was it different when you played for us in the Tundra social hour? It was one problem that I have is that my hands still shook. You didn't see it, uh -huh. but my hands and legs were shaking. And that's what usually happens when I perform live. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then when you're performing in front of an audience, they actually see you shaking like this while you're playing. And when you shake like this, it hampers your playing. So it was when you, when I do that, I, I concentrate more on trying to stop the shaking. And, th and if I do that, that's where I have memory lapses and it's pretty much downhill from there. <laughs> totally. Totally. Um, okay. Thank you. So what I usually find when, whenever faced with a challenging situation is to kind of turn towards it and lean in. Um, and I've had, many moments of stage fright. In fact, I always bring this up because um, because it's kind of funny, but every intimacy hour I get afraid because this is, you know, unscripted. We don't have an agenda. And I actually like to teach with no agenda all the time. Ask guy, it drives him crazy. But for some reason, the, the idea of lecturing on a certain topic for 20 minutes, like without knowing what it is in advance, it really freaks me out and I hate it. <laughs> um, so I find myself resistant to doing intimacy hours for that reason. But um, so thank you for helping me out that because really this is what I would suggest is maybe going up to the microphone. I know you're um, and, and just saying like, wow, hey everyone, it's so amazing to see you all. I want you to know that I totally have stage fright. I'm terrified to be here right now. And I would love it if you guys could send me some love um, as I play, because sometimes my hands shake and I forget things because I'm focused on this fear that kind of grips me in my belly. So any love you can send my way while I'm playing would be so appreciated. Um, enrolling your audience to help or enrolling them to be a part of your real authentic experience is endearing, I find. Like I always find leaders who share their real truth to be so endearing and charming and enchanting and make me feel like they're, they know who, they know about my experience because they're sharing their experience and vice versa. So I think it's vulnerability is like a bridge of connection and it can be scary because, you know, we may have been taught in our childhood not to be vulnerable or that to be vulnerable was unsafe. Um, but I think as an adult human, vulnerability is, is like the pathway towards greater intimacy. And that includes in your work. Um, another few suggestions I could have for you. Uh, doing the shaking exercise. Have we done that before together? 
You haven't done that one? Okay, let's do it now. Um, so doing sh the shaking exercise before you go out, go out on stage or doing some breath work. Um, we have a bunch of guided meditations on our YouTube channel and you could put, play one of those in your headphones and do breath work. Cause breath work is what activates the vagus nerve, which helps change your nervous system from fight or flight to rest and digest. And I think that would really help you. And then anytime you're on the piano and you feel that fear coming, breathe in towards it because fear and stage fright and anxiety are often us pulling out of our root because anxiety causes us to pull up and out and sh make our breath shallow. Um, and then we kind of lose our connection with ourself and lose our connection with what we're doing. So breath work before performing, you know, uh, this shaking exercise I'm about to teach you, those can all be ways to help your, help your body just get back to center. Okay, so I'm gonna try to do this with my microphone on. So you can go ahead and stand up. Okay. So animals in the wild, they don't store trauma because they naturally discharge anything that's running through their nervous system. So a predator could come and they escape and they shake or they sound or they move in a way that discharges their fear kind of like a toddler throwing a temper tantrum and getting up five minutes later, totally happy. So this exercise I've done on dates before in the bathroom, you can do it silently or you can do it with sound. The sound of your voice as you exhale also further activates your vagus nerve. So if you guys wanna do it with me, you can stand up. And for those of you on Facebook, happy shaking. <laughs> All right, so Greg, you wanna stand up with me? Great. All right, so everybody close your eyes, feel your feet on the floor and start breathing with those long, slow inhales and exhale with sound. <sighs> and keep breathing like that the whole time. And then begin to shake your body all over while you're breathing and sounding. And you can make the sound of your fear, shaking your hands, shaking your elbows, shaking your feet, shaking your hips, shaking your booty, shaking your shoulders, your neck, your head, your chest. Ah. Ah. And keep going, three more breaths. And then stop, close your eyes and tune into your sensations. You can call them out loud. I have tingles in my hands, I feel weight in my feet. I feel some heat in my neck. I feel lighter, I feel more clear. Let's so go ahead and sit down. And how was that for you, Greg? Let's see, I tried to unmute you. Hi, Hi. Um, it, it, it felt better. Actually, what, one thing that it did do, it helped, um, it, it, it helped relieve, uh, I had problems uh, with my wrist because I have carpal tunnel. Oh, so yeah. that actually helped. <laughs> um, it, hel it helped a little bit. I guess like the question that I have mainly is, and I think the whole point where I wanted to go with this was, um with my with my stage fright is 
the stage fright manifests in how I deal with people in everyday life. And even now I'm like scared to death, even talking. Cause I think I'm making an idiot of myself. And how do you just, I think st- conquering the stage fright will be one step to just me actually being able to open up to people, which is extremely hard for me to do. And, you know, and really the way, and I think the reason why I have so much stage fright is because music is really the only way that I can really release myself and through my piano playing and through my compositions. Mm. And I think it's just, for me, it's a very personal thing. And even when I have um, music compositions performed by other people and you got to let other people perform it for you and you're not in control, my anxiety actually gets even worse because you're sitting in the audience and the musicians are performing your music and you don't know how the audience is going to respond. And when, and in the end, usually what happens is, is that um, in the end of a, of a show, when my audience members want to talk to me, I usually run for the doors, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, which, which is something that you're not supposed to do. Um, so, I'll, so basically that's, that's, a, that's really where I want to see where I can go and just how, how to, um, how to cure your stage fright essentially. Yeah. And just really just enable me just to deal with people just in general. <laughs> that's awesome. I like your desire. <laughs> that's a that's a tremendous desire <laughs> it's a great one <laughs> mm. okay so changing ourselves can be long and arduous task but i think a part of the personal growth um the discovery phase of personal growth is the rewarding journey so you may not ever cure your stage fright, you know, just like, you know, for me, I have some abandonment and trust issues with men and I've done a lot of work on them and I continue to do work on them. And a part of the work that I do on them is studying Tantra and, and having all these wonderful, amazing experiences with you guys and teaching. And, you know, my path of mastery actually comes from the work I do on my own underbelly, my own, um, I hate the word darkness, but on my own imperfections, on my own shadows and, and learning how to love them is I think the task. So learning how to love your stage fright, learning how to love your inner child that probably developed a defense mechanism from way back uh, learning how to love the sensations that come with performing and that are a part of, you know, your gift to the world. I think the love is what starts to help us change. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know if we ever get rid of our core wounds. I think we learn through the layers of healing and through our path how to become more neutral with them how to handle them better, how to support ourselves, to give ourselves what we need um, ahead of time. So say, for instance, with your stage fright, if you, you know, you know that you're going out and it may not even be a performance, but say you want to open up to a group of people, say there's a dinner party and you've been invited and you feel like, oh, I I don't want to go because I'm going to have to talk to people. Um, You know, what I would do is I would make little games with myself. So you could make a game of, I'm going to say yes to the next five invitations, no matter what, no matter what they are, I'm going to say yes to them. And then what is it that I need to take care of myself so that when I go out on to this dinner party, I've been invited to, even if I feel all my fear and I'm going to do it anyway, what do I need to support myself? It's a very self-loving act. So you, maybe you need, Um, your phone so that you can take a note on someone you met so that you remember something about them in a later conversation, or maybe you need, you know, to go to the bathroom if you feel particularly afraid and shake it out, (laughs) you know, maybe you need um, to tell one person there how you're feeling so that they can support you. 
you know, and so all of these mechanisms are really, how can I help myself be loved and supported by myself and other people in this challenging spot that I'm learning to grow in, you know, and then next time you you get invited to the party, if that one's a success, you can remember like, oh, okay, even though I'm feeling this fear, I actually had a great time. You know, I talked to four people, this opportunity opened up because of it. You know, I had a great time. I'm going to go again, even though I feel afraid, you know, even though the fear might still be there. Um, Because I don't know if, if it ever goes away, but it might just lessen, you know what I mean? It might just lessen and get more easy to manage. I also do a lot of plant medicine work and I find that that really helps shift my nervous system patterns. Um, So if that's something that interests you, you know, we can talk offline about that. Does that help? Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, No, I don't mind the personal question, but I don't know if I'm gonna answer it. (laughs) Um, okay. So the next question was, what actually is good kissing? I'm going to let you answer that and I'll ask you. Oh, done. do you want to ask me now? And then I'll no, go. No, on. no you, I think everybody wants to see, um, I think everyone wants to see the make out. So <laughs> we, we can, we can wait until the end of the intimacy hour. Okay. <laughs> I'll come back to you. Uh, okay what is good kissing that is a great question because it's very very personal for everyone um great kissing I love kissing that engages all my senses so smell sight taste touch sound um kissing that invites my desire rather than can you guys hear me? I see confused faces. Okay. Um, rather than um, something that I have to manage. So I like to be kissed in a way that invites me to open. Um, whether that's a hard kiss with strong lips or a soft kiss, um, something that is like a, like a dialogue, like a, an interplay. Um, if you were open to doing a kissing demo, I could practice with you, but I can just describe it. The best way to um, show each other how you like to be kissed is to show each other how you like to be kissed. So one person can stay totally still and the other person is kissing that person the way they want to be kissed. So your partner knows how I like to be kissed and then you switch. The other person stays still and the other person kisses them in the way that they want to be kissed. And that can be a really lovely way to get to know each other and your kissing desires because not everyone kisses the same. Does that help? Um, Oh, I don't know. Oh, we are unmuted. Yeah. Yep. Yay. Yay. Hi. Hi. makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. Did you have a more specific question about it or? No, I mean, I was just like, this was on my like, sort of backlog questions. I kind of was just curious about anyway, because I've never really considered myself to be a good kisser and was just curious, like, what, how do you get better? and How do you improve? And it makes so much sense that, oh, yeah, actually, this is like every other thing. It's, just, it's communication and dialogue and it, it has to be on a, on a one-on-one level and the whole just demo it for each other is a such a beautiful example of how you can communicate with your partner to figure this out to negotiate those things just like we talk about negotiating your desires absolutely 100 percent. well thank you and also practice makes perfect so (laughs) not terrible homework (laughs) awesome thank you yeah thank you hi Hi. So there's a theme to the things you're saying, I'm noticing. Mm-hmm. That vulnerability is a really big thing that is your friend in all of these situations. Um, and I, I mean, I actually related a lot to like what, what Greg said back there and then what, what you said to him. Um, it's kind of like very similar advice that you're like pushing this vulnerability thing. <laughs> and um 
you're like amazing in the sense that you seem like this incredibly open person. I mean, you're, you're talking about like kind of a little bit of your past and where you're coming from and that you weren't always like this. And I, I can't, I can't picture that because like I'm looking at you right now and you're like so fabulous sitting there and you're like goddess silky yeah. slip with like you have like this totally open body language you're so like with the hair and the pillows and everything and it's like I, I mean it's not that the advice that you gave like you know wasn't helpful but I, I just when you, when you talk about being that way I, I have no idea what you're <laughs> I have no idea what you're saying. Um, I don't. I don't know what that word means, and I don't know how to approach something like that. And I um, come from a family and a culture where the concept of vulnerability was basically just weakness. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's just I don't know. Like I don't know how you got to be the way that you are. Um, so. Wow. Where do you, like, I don't know if you're comfortable with, like, sure. talking about it. Um, where did you start from a place where you were, like, just, like, zero? And you were, like, okay, I understand this concept intellectually and that that's going to, like, move me forward through all my communications and relationships in life. But, like, I don't know how to, like, approach this practically at all. How did you go from there to, like, you? really good question the question if you're comfortable sharing yeah I'm happy to share and thank you for your question and also thank you for your vulnerability in asking the, that question because you just did it <laughs> you just did it yay uh -huh. <laughs> <Either> way, <laughs> yeah. now. yes okay great um so one I would love to have you in erotic sovereignty we, we start the next round in February. I can't hear you if you're talking. You want to you wanna hear why I didn't join the class? Sure. For this reason, because I could not, I like was, I went to that free um, thing mm -hmm. and I just realized that there's just like, there's no way that I'm going to be like open in this group of women. And I'm like, I don't know why would I why would I waste the space in the class and kind of be like the wet blanket who can't like join in because I'm just like incapable of like opening up that way and you know like yeah. Mm. Thank you for sharing and um, I I really want to share with you that you're not alone and that a part of the gift of doing work within sisterhood is that you get to see you're not alone because you're not the only one who feels that way, who feels like um, everyone else has, you know, a better chance than me. You know, I, I personally struggle a lot with competition and we get taught as women to compare ourselves all the time. We get taught as people to compare ourselves all the time. And so there is kind of a running theme that I see within the women in the group and from my own self, like, oh, if this person it's, it's for them. Like they get to be, they get to be free and they get to be self-expressed and they get to have what they want. And, you know, me, I don't get to have that. I don't, I don't deserve it. I'm not worth it. You know, all the, the stuff that lives in our belly and our power chakra, but it's actually surprising that when you get into a group and you hear other people share the same thing, you don't feel so alone. And then there's an opening that happens from that sense of community and sense of empathy and a willingness to be seen in our vulnerability. Um, because you're right. You're not the only one who's been taught it's weak, you know, definitely not. And I was taught it's weak too. And, and so many people. Um, but the truth is like, when we don't acknowledge our vulnerability, our, our power is more bravado, you know, like the, the, this uh, third chakra is about power and vulnerability, the underbelly. And you actually can't have one without the other. We need them both. There, are, our darkness is the other side of the coin of our greatest gifts. Like they go hand in hand. They're actually inseparable. And the courage to be seen in our vulnerability is a bold step and it takes a lot of courage. Um, 
and courage that I think once you kind of start inching your way into it, gets easier over time because it's like you get to see, oh, the last time I was felt afraid of being vulnerable, but I did it anyway. Like I met a new friend, you know, or I actually got someone who, you know, reflected back that they cared about me in the place I was afraid. And that helped heal my heart a little bit, you know? And it's like those kind of micro movements or baby steps are the way that <clears throat> for me, I've gone along my path. It's a really feminine path. Um, Tantra is a very instinctual path. And the way I've learned to follow my desire into manifestation is like following each next right step. It's like a breadcrumb. Like I did this and then my, my impulse or my instinct was to take the next step, which is, okay, you went on the preview this time. Maybe the next step, maybe the next time you sign up or maybe you don't, or maybe you unmute yourself and ask a question just like you did tonight. And that's how we grow. I really don't, I think that a lot of us, you know, we have these grandiose visions of like, I'm going to go from here to there. And if I don't, I'm a failure. So I might as well not even try. But that's not, I don't think that's realistic. Like that's what we get shown in the movies, but like who actually grows like that, you know? Or maybe you have like a big ayahuasca experience and then you're like, whoa, I changed. <laughs> that's possible too. But that slow and steady, like, you know, the, the turtle that wins the race is, I think, how best approached, um, how we can best approach our personal growth work. Because you don't want to blow yourself out or like take yourself into super scary land and then have a major contraction. But little tiny baby steps. And um, let me see, your question was like, how did I get? Yeah, I mean, like I started this work when I was 27. I was a nanny and a house manager in Seattle. And I heard other people, actually it was in group work. I heard other people talking about their life and they talked about being leaders in community and being in open relationships. And I tell you at that point, that was completely foreign to my life. Like I never would have even thought I wanted that either of those things, but I felt this buzz in my body when they were talking, when people would get up and speak. And I like thought, oh, I must want that too. How does that happen? I would talk to other people about how they got there or I would ask questions or I just would follow myself and say, okay, this is my desire. How's it gonna come into manifestation? And it took a few years, you know, it took a long time for me to be open. My relationship, it took two years for it to open of just like conversations, like vulnerable conversations where my, my former husband at the time would, when I would bring it up, my desire to be in an open relationship, he would say, oh, you're so cute. I just don't know how that would work. You know, it wasn't, ever, there wasn't ever animosity. It just like we, he was like, I don't, I don't see how that can possibly be. But then we moved uh, to a different state and I brought it up again and I said, you know, let's just try it and see how it goes. And if, if either one of us don't like it, we can totally veto it. And I said, let's do a six month try. And he's like, okay. And so we did, but that was two years for that. And, you know, sensitizing myself orgasmically took quite a bit of time. I was very numb for a long time. And then I had all this anger in my body that needed to release and lots of cathartic releases that actually happened through my tantric practices. So um, that's, I guess how, what I'll say is like, it's, it's baby steps. That's how it works, baby steps. Um, and that's the most loving way you can take yourself there. Does that help? Yeah, okay, great. And I'd love to have you in erotic sovereignty <laughs> next time if you want. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for joining the Intimacy Hour and our beautiful conversation on vulnerability. Um, I hope you all got a lot out of it. And hopefully we'll see you tomorrow night at the Tantra Social Hour or at the Yoni Egg class or any other classes coming on the Tantra path. So um, loving you all. Good night. Bye.